So this is week two of our series, Good in All Time. We're told in Hebrews 13.8 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is always good. He is always trustworthy. He is constant. And so there's that turn of phrase, right, all in good time, and we sort of switched it a little bit. Good in all time. That is what Jesus is. He is always good. And now this isn't a hard and fast way to break up Matthew chapter 11. One commentator pointed it out. I kind of liked it. I thought it would serve us well here. And so we'll use it for these three weeks. And so we see in these three sections Jesus in three different ways. So last week, it was Jesus as the promised Messiah. Jesus in the past. He's been spoken of by the prophets. All of Scripture, all of the Old Testament is about Jesus. And then all of the New Testament is, so Jesus, what now? Like, what do we do in light of Jesus, right? It's all about Jesus. So when we read the Old Testament, we have to be reading, looking not for us, but for Him. So I use the example of the story of like David and Goliath. It's not like, well, I'm David, and so who are the Goliaths in my life? And how do I slay them? It's no Jesus is David, and we're Israel, and we're standing on the sidelines watching Jesus fight our battles for us and doing something that we can't possibly do ourselves. So the whole Bible builds to him and needs to be read in light of him. That's Jesus in the past, the promised Messiah. This week, we'll actually jump into the future, and then next week, we will wrap it all up in the present. And so without further ado, let's take a look at this week's passage. It's Matthew 11, uh, 20 through 24. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. For I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. And so this passage definitely takes a much harsher tone than the one we looked at last week. I think that's kind of obvious, right? But there's a few things I want to call out here and spend time in this morning. And the first is this. There is a judgment that is inescapable in this passage. Jesus speaks with certainty and clarity that there is a day when everyone will be judged for what they have done. Now, the Jewish audience that he's speaking to here is not thrown off by this. They're well aware of the Day of Judgment. He doesn't throw that out, and they go, huh, what's that? They know exactly what he's talking about. In the Old Testament, there are references to the Day of the Lord or the Day of Judgment. We get a real clean and clear one in in, uh, Daniel chapter 12. It says, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who is charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, ba 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 but at that time, <laughs> but at that time, your people shall be delivered. We're getting through to because here's the good part in second in the second verse. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so, Daniel saying, "There's a time when everyone will rise and be." judged. It's also all throughout the prophets in various ways. We see the prophets talk about God judging the nations, which seems to coincide with the way Jesus sort of talks about these cities as entities, right? It's not woe to you the people of Capernaum, it's woe to you Capernaum. He sort of talks about them as wholes. The point is this, that they knew that there was a time that was going to come at some point in the future where they would be judged for what they have done. They'd be judged for how they lived. And there's something in all of us. Paul called it our flesh or our sin nature. 
there's something in all of us that hates this idea. We absolutely do not want to be responsible for what we've done. We want to do what we want to do, and we don't want anyone to be able to tell us differently. We never really grow out of that stage as toddlers, right? (laughs) Anyone who's ever tried to feed a small child knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? Here, take a bite of this. I don't want to... Well, you need to eat your dinner. I want a cookie. After you eat your dinner, and then it just breaks down into begging and pleading, like, okay, if you take two bites, then you can have a cookie. Just please take two bites. Hostage negotiations start. That's so. right. But we all have this thing in us that goes, I don't want to do this. I want to do that. And when we hear that there's a day of judgment when we're going to be held accountable for what we do, that rubs against that in all of us. We want to do what we want to do, and we don't want to be told differently. And then we definitely don't want to be accountable for the results of our actions. We don't want the way that we've treated people to be brought up and used against us. We don't want the way we've acted to be able to be used against us. We don't like the idea that all of those missteps along the way have consequences. This is an idea that people just wrestle with. Just no, they, we just fight it. We resist it. I don't want that to be true. I think this sentiment is what undergirds a lot of atheism. Because at its core, atheism is not a terribly rational, it's not a very strong philosophical idea. And I don't want that to sound as a jab at anybody here that may be an atheist or is questioning your faith, because that's not, that's not what I mean. And I went into detail last week about how I spent some time in college where I was really questioning my faith, and science and reason had brought me kind of to that point and then somewhat ironically brought me through that point as I studied Scripture. Um, And so if that's where you're at this morning, please don't take this as hostility, because that's not how I mean it. But what I mean is this, is that often atheists like Richard Dawkins will make the argument that because there's not enough evidence to prove that God exists, that means that he does not. But that doesn't logically follow you would need evidence that God does not exist to prove that he does not exist. Alan Plantinga is a philosopher who gives a really great example of this, that there's not enough evidence to prove that there's an even number of stars in the universe. That does not mean that there are an odd number of stars in the universe. That means we don't know how many stars there are in the universe. And so the rational position is to say, well, if there's not enough evidence, then I don't know. And so I think it's far more rational to be an agnostic that says, I don't know if there's enough evidence to support that God exists, and so I'm going to live my life as though he doesn't. That makes more sense to me, just rationally, than someone that says, there's not enough evidence, therefore there is no God. And yet we have writers like Dawkins and we have uh, famous atheists like one of my favorite magicians, Penn Jillette. Uh, And of course, many others who are quite firm that there is no God. Penn even named his band the No God Band. And what I think lies behind that a lot of the time, surely not all the time, but a lot of the time, is there's a deep desire to not be accountable. So we don't want to be responsible for the things that we do. We want to be able to believe that whatever I want to do, well, that's just fine and dandy, and I can do it, and nobody can tell me different. The idea that God knows what I'm doing, even what I'm thinking, and is going to judge me for it one day, is too much for some folks to grapple with. And so hence the old joke, right? There are two tenets of atheism. One, God does not exist, and two, I hate him. (laughs) 
because we don't want to be accountable. We don't want to be responsible for how we live. If God exists, and if he is going to judge us one day, then what we do has consequences. How we live matters. What we see here is Jesus saying, there's a day of judgment. It's real. You have to account for this. The way that you treat others, whether you follow God's commands or not, these are things that everyone is going to have to answer for. And so this is why evangelism is important. This is why as Christians, we can't just keep the gospel to ourselves. It can't just be this little thing that we all just share together and we're just fine and happy with that. We have to spread this because people are dying and they're going towards this judgment that they are completely unprepared for. And so that's why we did the evangelism training event that we did a few weeks back. And I'm still in the process of getting the video for that compiled. We'll put it up on the website. For those of you that weren't able to uh, attend, you'll be able to watch it after the fact. But we did that training because we want people to have tools to have spiritual conversations with the people around them. Our friends, our families, our neighbors, our coworkers, they need Jesus. We need to stand and speak up. And so if you went to that training and you've been having some conversation, man, I'd love to hear them, even if it's like, well, we had this conversation, it hasn't really gone anywhere. Like, cool, like, let me know, man. Shoot me an email and talk to me. I would love to hear some stories that are sort of born out from that training. And so we know that there is a judgment. That's the first thing. And the second thing is this, is that Jesus is the judge. We know that there's a judgment because Jesus talks about it, but we also see here that Jesus is the coming judge. That's our future tense for the week. Last week, past, he's the prophesied Messiah. And now he's the coming judge. To be sure, Jesus is returning. If you read the letters and the epistles in the New Testament without that in mind, a lot of them don't make any sense. Because they're all of the opinion that Jesus is coming back. And Paul seems to be of the opinion that Jesus is coming back Tuesday or sometime shortly after, right? (laughs) Part of Paul's letters to the church in Thessalonica are him assuring them that they didn't miss it. Because they're going, wait, what if we missed it? What if he came back and we weren't ready? And Paul has to be like, guys, trust me you're not going to miss it, right? <laughs> like, you're going to know when this happens. But in John's Gospel, we see it much more than in Matthew's, that he talks all the time about, I'm going to go away and then I'm going to come back. And the disciples are kind of like, huh, I wonder what he means by that. And then he goes away and they're like, oh, he's coming back. And Jesus isn't just returning, He's returning to be the judge. He's the one who will do the judging. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by His appearing in His kingdom. And so we get that from Paul's letters. But right out of Jesus' own mouth in John 5.22, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. And so there's a judgment, and Jesus will return some way, and He will be the judge. And what that means is that justice and love are not incompatible ideas. They are not opposite ends of the spectrum. They find themselves together here in Jesus. He is able to be loving, to be love itself, by His very existence, by His being sent By His work on the cross, He is love and He demonstrates what love is. And yet He is also the judge who is going to dole out justice on that day. And so it's important that we see this passage that we look at today, it sort of gets sandwiched in here. So we first get the promised Messiah And then next week, spoilers, we get the present Savior. But in between that, we get the coming judge. 
And so sure, Jesus is judged, but that judgment is wrapped up in these other things that he is as well. And it doesn't say that the judgment isn't happening. No, the judgment is happening, but it's softened in a way. He provides a way out of it through his being the Messiah who is coming to save his people and by being the present Savior who gives comfort to those who need it. Think of it like this. I had some teachers in high school and in college that would accidentally, on purpose, let slip that we had a pop quiz coming. A pop quiz, of course, is still, it's supposed to, you're not supposed to know that it's coming. And so we'd get like, oh, uh, so I heard a little rumor that next Monday you guys are going to have a pop quiz. We'll see you then. You're like, oh. Now here's the thing. We still had to take the quiz, right? We knew the quiz was coming. You could still fail. And some people managed to do so, right? <laughs> but we had a chance to study. We had a chance to look over our notes. We had a chance to prepare ourselves for the quiz. We could be prepared for the quiz. We were still given it, but it was wrapped up in mercy. And so Jesus is coming back to judge, but His judgment is He's already provided the answer in His grace. He's already given us the Gospel of His love so that we don't have to bear the weight of that judgment. The default posture of Jesus towards people is always love. John 3.16 is the most famous verse in the Bible. I wish more people knew 3.17 along with it, right? For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So this is why people like Westboro Baptist Church, street preachers who hold up signs of judgment and damnation, that's why they ring so untrue. Like I see those things and there's something in me that cringes, even though same Bible, and at some level I believe the same thing as this person. So what is it about that that, is, that puts me at odds with them? It's because that was never the posture of Jesus. Certainly not towards people far from God. The people who thought themselves close to God, that's a different story, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here. <laughs> Jesus here says, woe to you. And now we read that because we don't. no one uses the word woe. When was the last time you used the word woe? Unless you were like slipping and falling, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like, whoa, like we, we do W-O-A-H. We don't do W-O-E very often. It seems aggressive, right? It seems like offensive language. I don't mean like profane. I mean like not defensive. It seems like pointed. Woe to you, like there's a finger that's coming with this. But when you look at the way that word is used in the Greek, that's not what this means at all. It's not a threat, it's a cry of regret. Its synonyms would be like, alas. Why didn't you get it together? There's not anger in it, there's regret in it, there's sadness, it's grief stricken. Why? Why didn't you repent? Why didn't you turn around? You had the opportunity. Why didn't you do this? That's the posture of Jesus towards people who need Him. He looks out as the good shepherd and sees sheep without one and goes, I, I've got compassion. I want to help. I want them to find me. If our evangelism is not motivated by and saturated in compassion, it is not biblical evangelism. It has to be in compassion. That's Jesus' posture towards everyone. So there is a judgment. And Jesus is coming back and will preside over it. And He has provided this escape hatch in His sacrifice on the cross and His resurrection from the dead. And so I've alluded to this already, but the last thing here. 
is that Jesus gives these woes to cities that were close to him. These are the places where they're doing his miracles, where they're seeing his miracles. These are the places that have been exposed to him the most. These are the ones that are closest to him. They're most intimately familiar with him. Those are the places that Jesus is calling out here. So let's go through, there's six cities that he mentions. First he mentions Chorazin. What's interesting is that Chorazin, we only see in the Bible in two places. Here in Matthew and in Luke when it's the same story. That's it. We don't know anything else about Chorazin, which is really interesting to me. Why? Because he's saying that Chorazin has seen all of these mighty works, which reminds us how little we actually get of Jesus' ministry in the Bible. Like, we get this impression that, like, the book of Acts happened over one crazy weekend, and that, like, everything was just, like, rapid fire. Jesus' ministry was three years long. We don't get three years of material in the Gospels. John and his Gospels, like, man, I guess if you wrote everything down, there's not enough room in the world for all the books you'd write. It's like the most folksiest verse in the Bible. It's like, well, I reckon you couldn't even write them all. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus does so many things in chores and we don't even know about it. That's so interesting to me. We never hear about it. But they saw all of these mighty works, they get warned. And then Capernaum and Bethsaida, they get warned as well. And those are places we do get information about in the Bible where we see Jesus doing these miracles in the Gospel. Capernaum was Jesus' base of operations for a while. They would sort of turn that into tourism at some point. These are places that were in, intimately familiar with Jesus and His ministry. They knew who He was, and they knew what He was doing. And then He contrasts them with some other places. The first is Tyre and Sidon, which is an interesting one. Now, Tyre and Sidon were cities that were sort of famous for their paganism. They had kind of a like Las Vegas reputation back then, right? But there's an Old Testament connection here that's really interesting to me. So in the Old Testament, Tyre and Sidon are ruled basically by the king of Tyre. They've kind of annexed, I guess it's like Minneapolis, St. Paul sort of situation. So Tyre and Sidon are all kind of one conglomerate. The king of Tyre sort of rules over that. And he and David become good friends at one point. Tyr becomes known for their artistry. They've got all of these sculptors and painters and weavers and all of these different artisans. And so it's those artisans that come to Israel and work on David's palace. And then David dies and Solomon becomes king. And Solomon maintains the relationship with that king. And it's this great working relationship. And so Solomon's temple, right? It's this ornate building. Many of the workers come from Tyr and Sidon, these artisans that come to them. And so they maintain these relationships. There's trade between these countries, and they exchange cities at one point, and all of these different things happen. But then Solomon dies, and the king of Tyr dies, and new kings come in their place. And the new kings come in their place, and eventually we get to Ahab. And if you know the story of Ahab in the Old Testament, he's one of the kings that leads Israel into Baal worship. And he's led there by the king of Tyr. King of Tyr gives him a wife named Jezebel, whose name I'm sure you're all familiar with. Even if you don't know the story, you're still like, that doesn't sound like a good person. Like, <laughs> And so Jezebel is the chief enemy of Elijah the prophet. And so she leads Israel into Baal worship, and Elijah still kind of holds the fort. He keeps pulling for Yahweh, bringing people back to God. And so you get sort of that scene where it's like Elijah and the prophets of Baal, right? Where they sort of just, it's like miracle throwdown. <laughs> it's sort of this strange scene where he's like, all right, well, you guys, you get a miraculous offering, and then I'll get a miraculous offering, and we'll see who's bigger and better. And prophets of Baal are like dancing and singing. Of course, Baal doesn't exist, and so he doesn't set this thing 
on fire magically, and so Elijah kind of laughs at him. He's like, maybe your God's off using the bathroom and stuff. Like, that's literally, he says that. You read Kings, it's in there. And then Elijah's like, all right, well, get me all of the water you can find. Let's soak the altar because everyone knows fire and water don't go together so much. So let's soak this altar. God, do your thing. And it lights up and kind of shuts everybody down. Of course, then that almost cost him his life, right? And so it's this whole thing, all of this that eventually begins to get corrected, and then they fall away again, back and forth, and sort of the story of the Old Testament. But that drive into Baal worship, it all comes from the king of Tyre and Sidon. And so here's this city who is instrumental in pulling Israel away from God, and Jesus is saying it's going to be better for them than for the places where I did all these miracles on the day of judgment. Now Sodom, we know quite well, right? The reputation for debauchery is still known to this day. People are very aware of that. What's interesting to me is that when people think about Sodom and like, well, what was Sodom's sin? And we immediately think it's sexual in nature. But in Ezekiel, we're actually told directly what Sodom's sin was. This is one of the few times where it's like, you want the answer to this question? Here's the answer to this question. It's Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. So, Ezekiel first calls Israel Sodom's sister, which, ouch, right? He lays out the sin. It's not, it's not sex, it's pride. That's where this all starts. Is it's pride is the problem. It's pride that, well, we can do whatever we want, right? That mentality that says that I can do what I want to do and no one else can tell me different. God goes, that was the issue. That and they had excess. They had prosperity. And they didn't use it to help anyone. They, all they did was use it on themselves. That's a message that I think the church, particularly the American church, could learn a lot from. We had, you had pride, you had excess, and you didn't use it to help anyone else. And so when you look at these cities and you see which one Jesus says will have it better, that's pretty shocking, right? When you know the background, it's like, wait, 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 wait. So we've got these three cities that are infamous for their level of sin and debauchery, and Jesus is saying they're going to have it easier than these three cities where he hangs out and does all his miracles. It's the people who have already experienced Jesus, those are the ones he calls out. That stands out. And whenever you see Jesus in the Gospels using harsh language, it is always to the people that think they have it all figured out. It's always the people that should have known better. It's the Pharisees, it's the Sadducees, it's the religious elite. The people who saw his miracles. I mean, think about it. These are things that we only get to read about. They were there. They saw them happen. There are certain big events that it's like awesome to be able to say, I was there. Right the day after Easter, I took a friend of mine uh, who was visiting us, and we went and did the Lambo tour, right? And so we do the tour where you get to go on the field and the whole deal. So we go down to the field, and the tour guide's talking about the ice bowl. And then he goes, and in the fifth row right there, that's where I was sitting with my brother. You're like, what? <laughs> Whoa, you were there for the ice bowl? Like, that's crazy. He's like, yeah, and we were right there, and this was the end zone where they scored the touchdown, and then we rushed the field and brought the goal post down. And you're like, that's awesome. You got to say you were there. I told the story last year. Cavs win the NBA championship. I went back to Cleveland for the parade. I had to be there. I didn't get the best spot, but I was there. 
Me and 1.3 million of my closest friends, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you can't possibly pick two events more dislike and weather than that, right? Because I got sunburnt beyond recognition and they nearly froze to death. But, but there were these awesome experiences to be able to be like, I was there. And you think about that and then you think about these people were able to say that for Jesus' miracles. You hear about the time that Jesus raised Steve's daughter from the dead? I was there, man. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. We were out there mourning, and he's like, oh, she's just sleeping. We're like, yeah, whatever, Jesus. And he goes in and brings her out, and she's just talking like everything's normal. I've never seen anything like that. So these two blind men, right? I'm standing there and I'm watching them. And they're following Jesus around the marketplace. And Jesus leads them into this house. And then like two minutes later, blind dudes come out and they can see. It was wild. I swear, I saw it. You're making it up. No, man, I was there. So we're at Chuck's place, right? And Jesus is teaching. Jesus is teaching. And all of a sudden, like dirt's fallen, and these four yahoos start digging through his roof. And they lower down their friend on a bed. And guys, I guess the guy is paralyzed or something. Jesus touches him. The dude gets up and he's like dancing. He's totally healed. I mean, Chuck still has to patch the roof, but... <laughs> like all of these incredible events. Think about it. They were there. They were the eyewitnesses for this stuff. They saw it. They saw one after another. We read about it in the Bible. The people of Chorazin, we don't even know what they saw. Who knows what miracles they saw? They heard Jesus say things we'll never hear him say. They knew what he sounded like. They knew what Jesus' laugh sounded like. They knew how good a singer he was when they started singing the Psalms together. Was Jesus a bass? Was he a tenor? Was he a little off key? Like, they knew. They're front and center for all of it, and they don't believe. They have front row seats for Jesus, and they miss it completely. And so ultimately, rejecting Jesus has consequences. When you're exposed to him, you're accountable for that. Revelation raises responsibility. Depending on how much you know, depending on how much you saw, you're accountable for that information. And so Jesus says it's going to be better to be from Sodom than from Capernaum. And I wonder if we could also pretty confidently say it's going to be better to be from Saudi Arabia than to be from Alabama. See, sometimes we need the gentle Jesus and sometimes we need the Jesus that's willing to confront us. And going through Matthew like we've been going, it gives us the opportunity to cover all of it. Because sometimes as pastors, we gravitate to one or the other. Like some pastors like to be very gentle and comforting. Maybe some pastors want to just like bring the smack down every week. But going through a book like we've done lets us cover all of it. We get to see all of this in context as we get this full picture of who Jesus is. And let's the Holy Spirit go to work on each of us individually for what we need right now. Maybe some of us need to be shocked out of our complacency and thrust back into motion. And so what Jesus is looking for here, the thing that they're missing is repentance. Repentance is a change of your mind and a change of your direction as it relates to God, as it relates to Jesus. Repentance turns to God and sees Him as all true, all worthy, all beautiful. It sees Him as worthy of obedience and it sees Jesus the same way. And this is what it looks like to put your faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is not this abstract thing that goes, yep, Jesus is a thing that exists. 
James tells us in his letter that, man, demons have that level of understanding. You've got to do better than that. And what we like to make it out to be, because I really believe that all of us deep down are secret Pharisees, like we all gravitate towards legalism, is we want to make it about how good we are. Like if I just pray enough, if I just read my Bible enough, if I just go to church enough, if I go to the right small group, maybe I serve on a ministry team, then that's going to make God love me. Those are all good things. I'd recommend you do all of those things. But there's nothing you can do that will impress Him. He has already demonstrated His love. You can't go, well, if I do this, then I'm going to show that I'm worthy of His love. He's already given the demonstration of His love in Jesus. He lavishly demonstrates that through Jesus' death on the cross. And so that's what His grace is all about. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. And so there's no way we can earn salvation. There's no way we can deserve it. It's a free gift that we receive by repenting, by turning to God and saying, you are all worthy and I want to follow you. Embracing Him for all that He is. And when we've turned towards Him, that decision, that it plants a seed that begins to bear fruit. Begins to change the way we act. Now, we don't see the commands of God as restrictive. We find them life-giving. We want to do them. We want to please Him. I had a surgery back in November, and many of you sent you know, Facebook messages or cards or sent food to the house or whatever, and it meant a lot. And thank you. But you didn't do it because you were afraid that if you didn't, that I was like keeping track and was like, ah, all right. Didn't hear from Carol. <laughs> like, that's not what, that's not why you did it. You did it because you appreciate me as pastor and we care about each other, and you wanted to do something nice for me. And so when someone matters to you, you demonstrate that to them. You want to demonstrate that to them. And one of the ways that we demonstrate our love for God, that we've repented, that we've turned towards Him, is through obedience. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. The love comes first. It's called Fruit in keeping with repentance. That's what John the Baptist calls it. That's what Luke calls it in Acts when he sees it in the church. It's a change from the inside out, not the outside in. So the question for all of us this morning is have we repented? Have we placed our faith and trust in Jesus? Have we turned towards Him? Have we made Him the treasure of our lives, the thing that we live for? That is what His love and His grace calls for and calls for from us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this incredible gift that You have given us in Your Son. that we don't have to try to earn our way into You loving us, that You loved us first, even as we were Your enemy. God, I pray this morning that You would be planting seeds, growing seeds, Lord, bringing fruit to harvest in our lives. That we would repent, that we would turn to You, that we would see You as You are. And that we would have in our minds that there is a judgment 
that Jesus is coming back and he is coming to judge, that that would motivate us out of compassion to reach out to the people around us and to bring you and your gospel to them. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.